Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you. The Quran or the Bible, which is God's word, this is the topic for this afternoon's debate, symposium, colloquium, discussion, as you prefer to describe it. The speakers this afternoon present with an interesting contrast in qualities and personality. To my right is Dr. Anis Sharosh. He has often been referred to as a Christian Arab. Dr. Sharosh is an eminent theologian, highly qualified, as is indicated by the doctor which precedes his name. He is also highly qualified in the practical sense of the word as an evangelist. He is, in fact, the head of an evangelistic association. However, to ensure a fair focus on the credentials of each of the speakers, we have agreed that a Dr. Basil Jackson will introduce Dr. Anis Sharosh in due course. Mr. Ahmed Didat has been referred to as a Muslim scholar of the Christian Bible. He has indicated to me that he does not want a lengthy introduction. But I'm nevertheless going to take the liberty as the chairman this afternoon to say a few words on him. There again, in order to try and balance the focus that would be placed on each of the speakers. Dr. Uh, Mr. Ahmed Didat hails from a humble formal education background. He lays claim only to a standard six educational qualification in South Africa. In English terms, this would imply simply a few years of education at the lower secondary level. However, ladies and gentlemen, this has not dampened his zest and zeal and enthusiasm to champion the Islamic cause. He has always been concerned with big things in life. If one looks at him, he is a man of big built or stature. He's concerned himself in the initial stages of his life as a salesman. He has sold furniture. He has driven trucks and in recent days he has engaged in debates with highly qualified theologians, doctors and professors of theology. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that amongst your number are some rather eminent people who have traveled from distant lands in order to hear the discussions which will be presented by the speakers. You will be the jurors. My name is Mohammed Salim Khan. I'm a lawyer from South Africa, and it is my pleasant task to be a chairman this afternoon. As chairman, I occupy a neutral position. It is my task to ensure the fair and proper conduct of this meeting. It is therefore necessary and essential that we all proceed with due decorum, that we all contribute to the success of this symposium. The procedure briefly will be the following. A coin will be tossed in due course in order to decide as to which of the speakers will actually commence with their presentation. The first speaker will speak for a duration of 75 minutes, after which the other speaker, his opponent, will be entitled to a rebuttal of 15 minutes. Thereafter, the other speaker will make his presentation for a period of 75 minutes, followed by his opponent's rebuttal for a period of 15 minutes. You, the honored members of the audience, will be accorded an opportunity of directing questions at the speaker. The procedure which we intend to apply will be the following. You are to write your questions on pieces of paper, as legibly as possible, please, and to hand them to stewards who will actually be walking along the aisles, down the steps to my right and to my left. You will be able to identify them by the red badges which they will be wearing. These questions must indicate the name of the speaker, who you wish to address answers to those questions, and I will in due course read these questions out to, to the speakers who will then present answers to them. Ladies and gentlemen, to 
proceed to the meat of the matter, as it were, I am now going to request the speakers to come to this table in order to enable us to toss the coin and to decide as to who it is who will actually commence with the discussion. Dr. Anis Shirosh, Mr. Ahmed Didaf, will you please come to the table? I will, of course, address you in due course as to the outcome of this. you first. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters, between myself, Dr. Shorosh, and God Almighty, I do not have to speak a single word because in the recitation that you heard from the Holy Quran, in the mother tongue of Dr. Shorosh, God Almighty had delivered him and his mother Mrs. Shuru's senior, the message. He understood the language. And as such, what is now required for Dr. Shuru's to do is to come forward. He's already attired in Arabic garb. Give his hand. He's already attired in Arabic garb. Come forward, give his hand, and read the Shahada. But for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, who might not have understood the message, the Quranic message, I repeat it for you. The Qari read, says, Wa in kuntum في ريب مما نزلنا على عبدنا فأتوا بسورة من مثله. meaning that if you have any doubts with regards to the revelation given by God Almighty to His Prophet Muhammad, if you have any doubts, then produce a surah, a chapter like it. وَدُوُّ شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ in Kuntum Sadiqeen and bring forth your witnesses and helpers if there's anyone besides Allah to testify. Fa'illam taf'alu. So you will not be able to do it. Walam taf'alu. And you will never, never be able to do that. This this is a 1,400-year-old challenge that you will not be able to do it and you'll never, never be able to do it. So prepare yourself for the fire whose fuel is men and stones. Now coming to the topic, the Quran or the Bible. This topic was instigated by Dr. Sharosh. He urged that we discuss the Quran or the Bible and I have acceded to his request. Now in any dispute, the identification of the claimants or the disputants is imperative. 
it is a basic requirement that the witnesses identify themselves whether it is a trial civil criminal or theological the witnesses must identify themselves and in that the first witness according to the subject advertised is the Quran the subject is the Quran or the Bible which is God's word the Quran let us see what the Quran says about itself you want to know the name the name of the book what is the name who is the author let the Quran speak for itself in Surah Rahman that is chapter 55 verse ayah number 1 and 2 Allah says Ar-Rahman Allam Al-Quran it is Ar-Rahman the merciful God it is he who has taught the Quran the name of the book Quran and the source of revelation God Almighty the Quran speaks for itself uh, some of you my brother and I can see that you are smoking please this is a very serious topic it is against the rules of this arena for people to smoke please put down your cigarettes <laughs> Surah Rahman to help you my brothers and sisters to find this reference in the Quran it's difficult for the non-arab more especially for us Pakistanis Bangladeshis for us it's difficult to find references such as Rahman where do you find Rahman in the Quran which is an encyclopedia of 2000 pages this particular one I have in my hand with 114 chapters surahs where will you find Rahman if you have a translation like this this is by Abdullah Yusuf Ali it's available in the foyer outside a translation like this you open the index at the back and R just like in a dictionary look for Rahman and it'll tell you 55 and 55 is easy to find once you have found 55 ayah number one and two verse one and two easy to find this book is so cheap it's a very ill-fitting word I say it's so cheap 2,000 pages an encyclopedia of 2,000 pages with Arabic text English translation and commentary 2,000 pages for five pounds you people in Britain will appreciate this value I'm talking about when I had to buy the Holy Bible from a big booksellers here Hudson's this Holy Bible cost me 995 nine pounds 95 pence plus fat <laughs> you get two you get two for the price of one two and they are available I'm not here to do business but by the way they are available you owe it to yourself there is no better wedding present you can give Christmas present you can give birthday present you can give to your employer or to your employee than the Quran as well as you need it for yourself and again the Quran speaks about itself in Surah Jashia look for it under J Jashia ayah number one and two it says Tanzeelul Kitabi min Allah al-Aziz al-Hakim that the revelation of the book is from Allah the exalted in might full of wisdom chapter 45 ayah number one and two the Quran identifies itself that I am the Quran and the author is God Almighty coming to the Bible the Holy Bible no doubt on the face of it we have the words Holy Bible who put the word Holy Bible the printers beautiful calligraphy beautiful the calligraphy in this vast volume described by Dr. Sharosh in a previous meeting as a library of 66 books he forgot that the Roman Catholics have 73 books 
But between the 73 of the Roman Catholics and 66 of the Protestants, the word Bible is not in the Bible. It's an amazing situation. The witness hasn't got a name. He's anonymous. In the vast encyclopedia, the word Bible is not in the Bible. This is a concocted word, concocted by learned men. They got this word Bible from the Greek word Biblos. Biblos means a book, from which now they got the word Bible. Bible means a book. It is not a name. But though today we use it as a proper name, the Holy Bible, but the Bible is not in the Bible, and the Bible doesn't say that I am the book of God. We will prove to the contrary. But let us find, let us see what the Christians themselves, they say about their holy book. I have here a book. Is the Bible the word of God? Big question mark. This question is asked by Dr. Graham Scroggy. And it is published by the Moody Bible Institute. They are not the Moody people in America, but the title name of the printers are Moody Bible Institute. They printed this book. The idea is to prove that the Bible is the word of God. And in this book, before I come to that, I have given a reply to that book. In a booklet of mine, is the Bible God's word? And this booklet was supposed to have been given out to each and every one of you. In case you haven't got it, I take it on your way out, will be given one. If you don't get it, get it from the Islamic Propagation Center in Birmingham. It's absolutely free. This gives you an idea of what the Bible is, what the Torah is, what the Zabur is, what the Injil is. See, generally the Muslims don't know Though we say we believe in the Torah, we believe in the Zabur, we believe in the Injil, what these words signify, the Muslim does not really know. So if you want to know, here is a book, they'll give you all that in detail. But coming to the Christians themselves, what they say about this holy book. Dr. Graham Scroggy, he quotes on page 22 and 23, a certain Dr. Joseph Parker, Joseph Parker, who says, this is to prove that the Bible is the word of God. He says, what a book is the Bible? This is typical American. You know, the way that, what a fantastic, what a lovely bunch of people. You know, what a fantastic <laughs> group of people. This is, what a book is the Bible? in the matter of variety of contents. You know, variety is the spice of life. Things that are different, different, different in the matter of variety of contents. He says, whole pages are taken up with obscure names. Names you never heard before in your life and you're not likely to hear them in the future. Obscure names. And more is told of a genealogy than of the day of judgment. Stories are half told, and the night falls before we can tell where victory lay. He's asking, where is there anything in the religious literature of man to correspond with this, to compare with this? And we have to admit, no way. But does that prove that it is the book of God? That is what we are going to analyze. Phrase by phrase, whatever the man says, let us analyze the serious implication of his utterances. Like this, he's tantalizing, he's mesmerizing people with words. Beautiful necklace of words, 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 meaning nothing. Listen. He says, <laughs> whole pages are taken up with obscure names. You don't know what he's talking about. So, here is a page from the Bible. I'm going to read out these obscure names. Names which I 
take it. There's not a single one of you has ever heard it in your life before, and you're not likely to hear it again, even if you live to 100. Listen. Ludim. Anamim. Lehabim. Neptuhim. Patrusim. Kasluhim. No, this is, I'm not reading out of context here. I'm only reading a verse from 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 11. I want to know if there is a single one in this vast audience have heard these names before. Please put up your hand. A single one of you who have heard these names, Ludim, Anamim, Lahabim, Naptuhim, Patrusim, Kastuhim, Amazing, amazing. This is from the Holy Book. God Almighty took the trouble of having this dictated to you and nobody heard it. You know, and I challenge, I challenge you, my brothers and sisters, if you can produce anybody with his birth certificate at the IPC up to the end of the month with the name Ludim, Anamim, Lahabim, Naptuhim, Patrusim, Kasluhim, 100 pounds each. Anybody with these names from the Holy Bible, anybody, you produce a birth certificate, Dr. Sharosh, Dr. Sharosh, you heard these names before, sir? Have you heard them before? You have. You know who they are? You know who they are? The doctor says he knows who they are. We accept it. You see? <laughs> no, if you give me your birth certificate, you have it. I had a Palestinian doctor. I was giving a preview of this talk in the UAE. And the chairman of the meeting was Dr. Muawiyah Shunar. He was a Palestinian Muslim, Muslim Palestinian. And I'm asking the doctor, doctor, have you heard these names before? He said, no. So I said, shame on you. I said, shame on you, not to Dr. Sharosh, I mean Dr. Muawiyah Shunar. You see, he's a Palestinian Arab Muslim. So I said, shame on you. She said, why shame on me? I said, these are your forefathers. Because the Bible says that these are the forefathers of the Palestinians. And the Palestinians didn't know. You know, these beautiful names I read to you, Dr. Sharosh has published a book, Jesus, Prophecy, you remember the book? On page 55, it says here, the Arabs in prophecy. This is a enlarged photo stat from his book, in which this chart of the nations, Dr. Sharosh gives us, the nations of the world, where they originate. And he gives us more than 40 different names. The originators, the forefathers of the Germans, the West Europeans, the Indians, the Iranians, the Arabs, the Jews, the Egyptians, the Libyans, and the Ethiopians, and on and on. He gives us more than 40 different names from the Holy Bible, but not one of them of his ancestors is mentioned, not one. Let us go back to our Dr. Joseph Parker. He says, and more, more is told of a genealogy than of the day of judgment. God Almighty, should be interested in talking to us, telling us about the Day of Judgment. You have to face your Lord. One third of the Holy Quran, one third, deals with the life hereafter. Heaven, hell, Day of Judgment. One third. But 
our Dr. Joseph Parker is boasting that in the Bible, more is told of a genealogy than of the Day of Judgment. Let us see whether his words are true. I have brought with me two genealogies. Genealogy means your ancestry, the ancestry of a person, your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, and on and on and on. Where you originate? Here is one. The genealogy of Jesus Christ as given in the Gospel of St. Matthew. Here, thank you, here is another genealogy of Jesus Christ. This is from the Gospel of St. Luke, St. Luke. Between the two, these two inspired authors, inspired in inverted commas, they give you 66 fathers and grandfathers to Jesus Christ, 66. It's an amazing situation. A man who has no father, we believe, no Muslim is a Muslim, if you contest this fact, we believe that Jesus Christ was born miraculously, without any male intervention. He had no father. His creator was God, by his act of will. God created Jesus. Says God Almighty, that whenever he wants to create anything, he merely wills it, and the thing comes into being no father, born miraculously. Matthew and Luke, they give us 66 fathers and grandfathers to a man who had no father. And they say, they say in this genealogy, there is only one name common to these two lists. There are two separate lists, but the only one name common to the both, and that is Joseph the carpenter. And Joseph, Joseph the carpenter was not supposed to be there. A man who's not supposed to be is there. And it tells us that the father of Joseph the carpenter, Matthew says, the name of Joseph's father, the grandfather of Jesus was Jacob. And Luke tells us that the grandfather of Jesus was Heli. Contradiction. At the very start, the man who's not supposed to be there is there, and his grandfathers, there are six such contradictions in the genealogy alone. And this man, Luke, he tells us, says now, Luke chapter 3, verse 23, it says, Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being, words in brackets, words in brackets, as was supposed the son of Joseph, the son of Heli. He is son of Joseph, the words in brackets, as was supposed. Of course, doctor will explain to you where the brackets come from. You see, in the codexes that the Christians are boasting about in the British Museum, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Alexandrianus, Codex Vaticanus, the, name, the words as was supposed are not there. But so they put them in brackets to help the reader that, look, he is not actually the son of Joseph. It was supposed, people thought that Joseph the carpenter was his father, his supposed father. So the words are in bracket. But in the 2,000 different languages of the world, in Arabic, in Urdu, in Gujarati, in Zulu, in Afrikaans, the words as was supposed are there, but the brackets are removed. You see, it's very, very easy to manufacture in Christendom the word of God. First you put them into brackets. In the English Bible, they are in brackets. But every other Bible in the vernacular, the words are there, but the brackets are taken out. In other words, they are telling you that these are the words of Luke. And if Luke was inspired, meaning they are the word of God. So this is how the words are being manufactured. Word of God, which is not the word of God. So Allah says, so woe to them who write the book with their own hands. Then they say, this is from Allah. That they may reap some small benefit, some small reward. 
by their experimentation. And so woe to them for what their hands do right. And woe to them for what they earn. These are not the words of God. Stories, Dr. Joseph Parker continues, stories are half told. And the night falls before we can tell where victory lay. Means we don't know the head of tail of what the whole thing is all about. How beautiful. And the night falls before we can tell where victory lay. What happened, man? What was the outcome of all this? Here. Here. I'm giving an example. Matthew. Chapter 27, verses 52 and 53. It says, And the graves were opened. Graves, graves. No cemetery in the cemetery, graveyard. The graves were opened. After the alleged resurrection of Jesus, the graves, graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep and were dead and buried were raised. And coming out of the graves, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city of Jerusalem and appeared to many people came out of the graves and they marched down the streets of Jerusalem. People in their coffins or napkins are all worn out, only skeletons. They came out of the graves and they walked the streets of Jerusalem. And what happened? Finish, that's all. Finish, full stop. Look, when people come out of the graves and walk the streets of Jerusalem, surely people saw. And that's news. That would become world news. You know that? If people from the graves come out in Birmingham, I tell you, it'll be world news. Walking the streets of Birmingham in the, in the napkins. It'll be news. But out of the 27 books of the New Testament, only Matthew records it. Nobody else saw it. Nobody saw it. Nobody heard about it. Look, look, once you come out of your grave, would you like to go back? <laughs> huh? What happened to them? Where did they go? Were they transformed? Did they were taken up to heaven? What happened? Nothing, not one word. Surely, if you came out of your grave after your death, you'd like to go and meet your wife again? No? Second time? Have a second inning? So, stories are half told, and the night falls before we can tell where victory lay. Where is there anything in the religious literature of man to compare with this? Agree, agree, there isn't. Agree! But does that prove it's the word of God? No, no. Stories are half told. I'm reading to you now. From the book of Judges. A book in the Bible. <coughs> After him, Judges chapter 3 verse 31. <coughs> After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines. One man. He killed 600 of the Palestinians. One man. With an ox gold, ox gold. And he also delivered Israel. Now, this gold, gold. I don't know how many of you know what is a gold. You see, the first time I read about this as a young man, I read it in the book of Acts, Acts, A C T S, Acts, chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, where it says that Paul, while he was on his way to Damascus, he saw a vision of Jesus. Jesus appears to him and he says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why are you harassing me? What are you persecuting me for? Why kickest thyself against the pricks? And I was shocked. So what kind of a book is this? Using such filthy, dirty language. So I went out on my search as a youngster asking the priest, what is this? And the priests were helpless. They were helpless. They kind of explained to me what is Jesus talking about kicking against the... I won't repeat it. Now, in the Bible that Brother Sharosh 
he presented to me at the Royal Albert Hall this beautiful Bible here this is the fifth major revision this Bible is the fifth major revision brother Shorosh not just said it's true fifth major revision I didn't know you see I thought the King James Version or in England they call it the authorized version was the one of 1611 that it has been already through five major revisions and they still call it King James that's an anomaly you see in the time of King James 1611 this Bible was brought together then they found there's something not altogether right so they made a major change major you understand English major minor minor is small major is big it's not fiddly little things major you see this is like your great 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 grandfather he made his last will and testament and your great great grandfather he made a major change in that will and your great grandfather made another major change in that will and your grandfather made another major change in that will and your father made another major change in that will and you made another major change in that will and you're still insisting that this is the original last will and testament of your great 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 grandfather amazing use of language imagine the language that they're using five major changes revisions and they still say it is the King James Version so in this major revision they change the word the word of that offensive word to gold gold go and ask the Americans what is a gold when you go out when you meet the Englishman ask him what is a gold and believe me he won't be able to explain to you what is a gold so I yes I show you this 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 Sir, sir, sir. Thank, thank you, my, thank you very much, my dear brothers and sisters. You see, to make it easy for my brothers and sisters who never heard the word original word, they never heard the word gold. That this guy Shamgar, he used an ox gold. So I brought it for you. You see, this another word for this is a cattle prodder. They brought cattle to move. Ox goat, cattle prodder, spiked stick. There's a little nail here. Spiked stick for prodding. You know, with this stick, this Jewish lad, Shamgar, he killed 600 Palestinians with this. You know, you can't, you can't destroy 600 snowmen with this. You know that? This thing will break 600, 600. It's a miracle, yes. This is the miracle. It's a miracle. We must accept that, you see, this is now, is programming people. If one Jewish boy can six, kill 600 Palestinians, what were the Palestinians doing? <laughs> Look, I said the fools, they couldn't run. They couldn't run for their life. What were they waiting? Where? And where did the fellow strike them with this to kill 600? One, two, three, four. <laughs> we have with us a very learned brother here on the stage. He is a psychiatrist, a man who studies psychology. He will be able to tell you when you make people to read stories of this nature. What a certain Jewish boy did to your people, 600 of you with this stick, your psychology, your mentality, what happens to it? I'll demonstrate to you what it really happens. That's not the end. Then they tell us, in credulous fairy tales, the book, it says here, another Jewish young man, by the name of Samson, 
You heard about Samson, Samson and Delilah. You know the story that Cecil Dimmel made famous, Samson and Delilah, David and Bathsheba. You know the stories, the films. This fellow Samson, I'm reading now this from the book of Judges, chapter 15, verses 15 and 16. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. A donkey jawbone he found, fresh, fresh. He reached out his hand and took it and killed 1,000 Palestinians with the jawbone of a donkey. <laughs> Since farmer, because you see, our brother happens to be a Palestinian, he ought to know that this is now programming taking place. Look, beautiful. One Jewish boy with the jawbone of a donkey, he kills 1,000 Palestinians. I want to know what the Palestinians were doing. You know what's a thousand? A thousand people you kill with the jawbone of a donkey and what they do? I said, look, if these thousand people, they spat on him, the guy would have suffocated. <laughs> you can't even spit. You can't even run. Then he says, it's a miracle. Oh, the stick is a miracle and the jawbone of the donkey is a miracle. You know, we should go and tell the Israelis, they're wasting their time with those American cluster bombs. You know, in Beirut, they start to eliminate the Palestinians for good, the final solution. The final solution with American cluster bombs and they failed. I said, look, man, go and tell them, find the jawbone of the donkey and find this magic stick, this magic stick. You'll do a cleaner job. And Samson, after killing the thousand Palestinians, he sings a song. So when the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. Hooray! Say hooray! <laughs> then, this book of God, in inverted commas, book of Judges, book of Judges, that's the name of the book, chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. It tells us that the same Samson, Samson, he's got magical powers. He went and caught 300 foxes. You know fox? You know what's a fox? Lomali, Lomali. You know to catch a chicken. In, 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 to catch a chicken in the, in, in the open. Catch one chicken, catch one sheep, catch one goat. You know what an ordeal it is? You haven't tried. You catch them in bins. You have them ready, dressed. You know, dressed fowls you call them. The undressed ones. And you go and bake them. You try and catch one live chicken, live sheep, live goat. This Samson Jewish young man, he caught 300 foxes. Foxes. In Palestine, where did he find them? 300 foxes to go and get 300 foxes. And he caught them and he tied them tail to tail. Two, two at a time. Two, two. It doesn't say male or female. Two, 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 two. He made 150 pairs. 150 pairs of male and female. Shh, shh, shh. He tied them up and they cooperated. The foxes cooperated. Can you imagine? Tame dogs, man, poodles, you know, poodles as little tiny dogs. You try and tie, try to tie the tails of two and see what they do to you. <laughs> but, but Samson, you see, he had those magic powers. Hmm? He cut them and he tied them tail to tail and he put fire between the tails fire between the tails, and they cooperated. And he told them, go for the fields of the Palestinians, and they went. And they destroyed the fields, the granaries of the Palestinians. I said, you believe that? You believe that? He said, yes. <laughs> you know, today, another Jewish lad, Sylvester Stallone, he goes as Rambo, Rambo 3. <laughs> he is Shamgar and Samson in one. Shamgar and Samson in one. Rambo, Rambo, Rambo 3. This fellow, single-handed, almost, he killed one, two, three Russians. That's a figure given. If you count on the film, if you have the time, stop it, stop it. Every time he kills a man, count it. 123, and he vanquished the whole Russian army, and the Russian army was made to leave Afghanistan. Samson and Shamgar in one. Rambo three. You can do it in films. 
Anything, anything. You can do anything on film. But Cecil DeMille failed to produce those 3,000 foxes who would cooperate with him to, to put fire between their tails and go for the fuse of the Palestinians. He failed. He says, this is something. <laughs> no magic power. No magic of the camera can ever achieve that. Rambo did it. Samson and Shamgar did it. You see, there is a kink, a twist in the human cranium, in the human brain. There is a twist. Everyone, everyone. That the more preposterous the proposition, unbelievable, fantastic, unimaginable, the more preposterous the proposition, the more readily with the superstitious and the credulous believe it. Go on, go on, exaggerate, man. There is no limit to your exaggeration. Exaggerate and there'll be people wanting to believe it. They'll nod their heads and say yes. It can happen because it's in the book. The end result, what it does, we will come to that. You see, the Christians, they say, and I will deal with it if I have the time, they say the Quran is forged. It is copied from the Jews and the Christians. Dr. Sharosh, in the last debate, he said, Let me challenge you. 75% of the wonderful Quran in my wonderful language of Arabic is from the Bible. And I would urge you to look into the Bible and find out where these sources are. Let me challenge you. I'm quoting. He said, let me challenge you. I don't know whether he was challenging me or the audience or all of us. He said, let me challenge you. 75% of that wonderful Quran in my wonderful language of Arabic. Word for word, I'm quoting, sir. You can get this tape. The tapes are available outside. In case you, know, you doubt my words. Of that wonderful Quran in my wonderful language of Arabic is from the Bible. If I had the time, I'll deal with that in detail. I will deal with that in detail. Is from the Bible, means copied from the Bible is plagiarized from the Bible, is cribbed from the Bible. So the Quran answers that. Look, God Almighty, He doesn't need my help. He answers it. He says, Am yakulun aftara, or do they say He forged it, who Muhammad forged it? Pull, tell them, Fatu bi surat misli. So come on, produce a surah like it. And call your aid to your aid. Anyone besides Allah, in kuntum sadiqin. In other words, the challenge is there. Produce something like it. Muhammad did it. He copied it. Come on, man. You with your learning. You see, the Westerner had a good excuse. Swagat had a good excuse. You know, Jerry Falwell will have a good excuse. Billy Graham, good excuse. We don't know Arabic. We don't know Arabic. We don't know Arabic. Brother Shoros. <laughs> Dr. Sharosh has got no excuse. You see, thank you, thank you, my brothers. Dr. Sharosh, no excuse. He is a born Arab. He is not a Muslim who is converted to Christianity. He's born Arab, and his people have been Christians before Islam. Give them that credit. As he boasted in Birmingham at one of my meetings, he said, there are 10 million Arab Christians. 10 million, maybe more now. 14 million. 14 million Arab Christians. I'm open to be rectified. It was 10 million on tape. It's gone to 14. It's quite all right. These are Arab Christians. Arabic is their mother tongue, not the mother's tongue. The mothers have the tongue in their mouths. <laughs> no? Look, it's his mother tongue. It means come naturally to him. And the challenge is there for 1400 years, produce a chapter like it. Brother says he will. We are, will be anxiously waiting to listen to the chapter he has produced. Inshallah. Fourteen hundred years, they had failed. Dr. Sharosh has managed it, and we are looking forward with eagerness 
to his production. Copy, copy. I am asking, what is there to copy? What have you got that is worth copying? There are, according to one of the mightiest evangelists, tele-evangelists in America, he says, he writes a book on incest. You know incest? I won't belabor you. Incest. You see, when you go with somebody else's wife or daughter, have sex out of marriage, it is adultery or fornication. But when you go and sleep with your own mother, your own daughter, your own sister, your own daughter-in-law, that is incest. There are 10 cases of incest in this book of God. 10. The types and types of incest that you can commit. A textbook, if you want to know what were types. And as a result, in my country, the whites of South Africa, most of them are Christians. 8% of all whites in South Africa, they commit incest with their own daughters. And 13% of the Americans are committing incest with their own daughters. Our brother, I didn't, I didn't catch his name, but he's a psychiatrist. He will be able to confirm. Dr. Vernon Jones, a psychologist of great repute. He carried out experiments on groups of school children to whom certain stories were being read. And he said that these stories made certain slight but permanent changes in character. The type of story that you read will create the type of mentality that you have. If you read junky stuff, your mind will become junky. You eat junky food, you will be, your body will become junky. Amazing. Out of the 10 cases of incest, Muhammad didn't copy a single one. Then you read, rape. Not only rape, how to rape your own sister if you want to, it's given to you in detail. If you want to rape your own sister. One of the sons of David, he sets you an example. What, what you must do if you want to rape your own sister? Gang rape is there. A son goes and prohibits with 10 of his father's wives, 10 in a row. I'm telling you, this is in the holy book. A Christian lady here in the UK, here in the UK, she wrote a letter, she says, ban the book. Ban the Bible. What it has, ban it. But of course, your salvation. In Dr. Sharush's book, um, Jesus, Prophecy and the Middle East, on page 35, he gives us a list of things that he's quoting, Listen America, by Jerry Falwell. And he gives us a list of the crime rate, the way it has increased in America. This is from his book. The type of things that you read, this is what you read, and the result. Book of Judges. The book of the Bible, chapter 16, verse 1. I'm reading. Diligent listeners, pay attention. Then Samson went to Gaza. You know Gaza? Where these Palestinian children, you know, are fighting for their freedom. You call them terrorists? Those little children are being mowed down. 200 and some 50 have already died. <laughs> Palestinian children. So Samson goes to Gaza, the same Gaza, and he saw a harlot, a whore, a prostitute, and he went in unto her, full stop. Come on, come on, tell me now, what does it teach you? Samson goes to Gaza, and he sees a harlot, a whore, a prostitute, and he goes in unto her, full stop, nothing more. There's not a single redeeming word or phrase that this guy, for what he did, well, maybe this was a Palestinian whore or prostitute. So it means nothing. This was a Palestinian. Maybe if she was an Israeli whore, it might have meant something. She was not an Israeli. So God didn't give him AIDS. He didn't give him VD. Didn't give him gonorrhea. Nothing, nothing, nothing. This great hero, he went to Gaza and he went in there to her. The more modern Bible, they say, he spent a night with her, what, doing what, hallelujahs. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. What were they doing? Spending the night with a prostitute the whole night. What do you do? Hallelujah. <laughs> Look, what is the moral? You see Ian Fleming, Ian Fleming, he wrote this 007, James Bond. I don't know whether you've seen it. I'm told that, you know, wherever he goes, he sees a beautiful woman, he goes into bed with her. Wherever he goes, he's like eating peanuts. Wherever he sees a woman, I'm asking Ian Fleming, ask him, where did you get the idea from? Here, here. The book is telling you. This guy goes to Gaza, he sees the prostitutes, and wholesale. It portrays God Almighty as a barber. You know, barber, people cutting hairs. It says here, Book of Isaiah. Book of Isaiah said, the prince of the prophets. You say the fifth gospel. Isaiah, book of Isaiah, the fifth gospel. In the same day, the Lord will shave with a hired razor. The Lord means God will shave with a hired razor. <laughs> Wahjam, Allah. Hired razor, this one here, sir. They didn't have safety razors then. Hired razor, the cutthroat, we call them cutthroats. With those from beyond the river, with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs. He will shave your head and the hair of your legs. It doesn't say how high. <laughs> you tell that to a barber today, you know, to shave. <laughs> He said, don't you know about Immat or Veet or what, what does it mean? You know in England, man, you see these adverts every day. Huh? God Almighty, he, he takes this and he's going to shave people's legs, hair on the legs. What are you trying to do to God, Yaqi? Here, 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 some more absurd, absurd nonsense about God. It says here, I'm reading from 2 Samuel, chapter 22, verses 9 to 11. It says, smoke went out from his nostrils, Allah's nostrils. You know, people learn to smoke and take out smoke from the nose. Where do you get the idea from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Smoke came out from his nostrils. You see, you smoke. and devouring fire from his mouth like a dragon. Flamethrowers, you know flamethrowers, they got the idea of flamethrowers, where they got it from, yeah? And devouring fire from his mouth, coals were kindled by it. Verse 11, he rode upon a chiru. He rode Allah bari ta'ala, he's riding on a chiru. And flew, God Almighty is flying on a chiru. You know what's a chiru? Do you know what is a chiru? No, no. You see, I went to St. Peter's in Rome. St. Peter's brother has also been there, I'm sure. He has been speaking about St. Peter's in his book, so he must have gone to St. Peter's in Rome. It's a huge, huge church. St. Peter's in Rome at the Vatican. Inside the Vatican, inside, you see, I don't know, the youngsters that were with me, you see, they made me to stand against the wall and they took some shots. And the shot was of this Chirubim. Chirubim is a plural of Chiru. Chirubim meaning young crisp angels. See, angels are beautiful women with wings. In Western artistry, designs, drawings, you find beautiful women, well proportioned. This is 36, 24, 36. <laughs> with wings are, you know, mature angels. And cherubi is a young thing. You find this in the Collins Dictionary, they give you a definition. A child-like angel. Childish angel. Cherubim. So the picture is here. I know for all of you, you to see, I think once it is on video, you'll be able to see that close quarters in marble. This was in flesh-colored marble. You can pass this on. You know, can you have, oh, you have seen it? You see, this is absolutely naked girls, absolutely in marble, flesh color marble. In the Holy of Holies, they have wings. 
That's the only thing. Otherwise, naked, you can see the breast, the nipples, and the buttocks. And if you fondle the buttocks, millions of hands have gone over the buttocks from the sheen on that marble. You can make out that everybody passes by wants to feel that marble. And there's a sheen, you know, this type of shine on the marble will give you an electric shock if you touch it. God Almighty, imagine, is riding these things, these young girls, young girls, young Christians. He didn't know about a helicopter, this God of ours. You know, he didn't know about a flying saucer. <laughs> He's riding little girls. What are you doing? What a mockery you are making of God. This is what hurts the Muslim. You are making a mockery of God. You say, and God told you this? He's telling you, right, little girls, naked girls? Shame. It's a shame. And And the Arab Christian has the audacity. Arab Christian. Ishaq Ibrahim. Ishaq Ibrahim. He wrote a book called Black Gold and Holy War. This is telling the Americans how best to fix up, you know, tighten the screw on the Arabs. He's an Arab. He is an Arab. His name is Ishaq Ibrahim. And in this book, he's giving ideas to the Americans and the Western nations how to tighten the screw on the Arab. But, by the way, he's describing in the book Allah Bani Ta'ala. God Almighty. He's describing Allah. This Christian, Arab is describing Allah because of the ideas he has got from his book. He says, I'm reading, page 70, the Muslim's view of God is that of an elderly cherubic Arab. You know, elderly but little baby like God, Allah. <laughs> this was cherub, cherubic. Where did he got it from? He got it from the Holy Bible. You know, God Almighty in this book, if it is the book of God, he seems to have a special predilection preferential partiality for the Palestinians. Special place he has for the Palestinians in his book, this Bible. That the Palestinians can be used not for cannon fodder, but for foreskin fodder. Never heard of it. I read it for you. 1 Samuel, book of Samuel, chapter 18, verse 27. It says here, Therefore, David arose and went, he and his men, Dawud alayhi salam, David, and killed 200 Palestinians. And David brought the four skins. You know when you do khatna, circumcision, that skin which you throw away, very valuable. Don't throw it away. It might be used for currency. When you go back to Israel one day, when you conquer that country, it might be used for currency. Same currency that David used. Listen. He killed 200 Palestinians, Philistines. And David brought the four skins and they gave, and they gave them in full count. Full count. He counted out. One, two, three. You know, like one pound, two pounds, three pounds. He counted out 200 cash, cash for skins to get a wife, a princess, you know, Saul's daughter, Michelle. He paid out in four skins of the Palestinians was used for currency, it's cheap, cheap currency, 200. Cheap, cheap, cheap. He counted them out. And God Almighty, some special liking, I said, I don't know what type of thing loves them so much, the Palestinians. And Moses, I'm re reading from the book of Numbers, chapter 31, verses 15, 17, and 18. And Moses said to them, have you kept all the women alive? All the women, you have kept them alive? Now therefore kill every male among the little ones. Every male child among the little ones of the Palestinians, kill them. And every, kill every woman who has known man intimately. If any woman has ever had sex with a man, kill them also. But keep alive for yourselves, all the young girls, not the little ones. Little ones is a liability. You've got to feed them and bring them up. No time for that. 
But keep alive for yourselves the, all the young girls, the Palestinian young girls, who have not known a man intimately. This is the instruction given to Jewish soldiers in the field. Now when they see a young Palestinian girl, how can you verify whether this woman has experienced sex or not? How do you verify? The soldier in the field, he doesn't know about the saliva test. He doesn't know anything about it. The only way is to rape and ravish these Palestinian girls to verify whether a man has been through her or not. And if they discover that she has already been used second hand, chop off her head. If not, keep them. And they saved for themselves 32,000 Palestinian girls whom no man had known. After raping and ravishing them, they saved for themselves 32,000 for themselves. And out of that, the Lord Almighty, God Almighty, must also have his pound of flesh. So it says, and 30 and 2 was for the Lord. I am asking, what does the Lord with do with, what does he do with 32 raped and ravished Palestinian girls? You tell me. In the book of God, God giving instructions that you go along and you verify. God talking this, filth and dirt, kill every little child, male and female, kill them all. Only young girls you must keep. And they too, one that know, they have not known man sexually. Now, now, if you believe, I am asking, my dear brother, Sharosh, you believe this Jewish folklore? You believe? Of course, he does. What happens? What happens? It ch changes your mentality. So he writes in his book, Jesus, Prophecy in the Middle East, page 80. It's a strange thing to him that the Arabs are fighting for Palestine. It's a strange thing. He says, I'm quoting him, let me quote. That the Arabs control three million square miles of land, but cannot allow Israel, their kinfolk. Ask the Jew whether he considers you as his kinfolk. Their kinfolk to have 10,000 square miles. That's all, only 10,000 square miles. The hallowed parcel of land, Palestine, has actually been in the hands of the Arab people longer than it has been controlled by the descendants of Jacob. Yet God promised it to this Jew. He believes that God promised it to the Jew. And he says here, not 10,000. Now he says, page 61 of the same book, he says, in fact, according to Genesis 15, 18 and Jeremiah 23, 7 and 8, the promise will eventually cover 180,000 square miles. From the river Nile to the Euphrates, he's prepared to give it to them. He's given it to them. What did it? That Shamgar's stick and Samson's jawbone did the job. See, psychology, it does it. <laughs> then what about southern Lebanon? <laughs> On page 85, he says, what about Israel's invasion of Lebanon in June 1982? Brother Shorosh says, actually, southern Lebanon is prophetically considered a part of greater Israel. So what are you worried about then? What are you crying for? You Lebanese people, you Arabs, what are you worried about? It's all promised to the Jews. Give it to them. <laughs> he cries, crocodile tears, in his book, Liberated Palestinian. He cries, so over two million of my people are suffering. I'm quoting. He said, over two million of my people are suffering. Many are bitter, sick, and lonely. Some have been in refugee camps for over 35 years. Now, over 40 years. And more. His father has been killed by the Jews. His cousin was killed by the Jews. But what is the end result of all this? His people are suffering, he says. They are bitter and sick and lonely, he says. He's crying crocodile tears for them. So now, he says, so, and he supports, page 175, and he supports a small Palestinian state on the West Bank. A small Palestinian state on the West Bank with its own police force. You have to look after the traffic, traffic police. 
but but without a standing army on the West Bank. No standing army. You know, amazing, this morning's paper, the Sunday Times, you find an echo of that very sentiment, as if it's his master's voice. You know, this old gramophone records, his master's voice. He's had Shamir, he's selling the very same thing, offering to the Palestinians. Wait, but you wait. You wait till the election is over, and then we will give you on the West Bank, uh, let me read his words. Let me read. I don't want to misquote the fellow. Yadzik Shamir. He says here, he said, uh, Yitzhak Shamir, the Israeli Prime Minister, has told Palestinians from the West Bank that the government might confer some authority on the occup occupied territories, but only after the Israeli elections later this year. Later this year. You have a chance of having your wishes fulfilled. Uh, this is the debate is that the thing that is the word of God Then it's 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 a natural thing that you have to listen hearken Whatever you are suggesting the guy is saying That the autonomy chance limited autonomy running everything in the territory except security Exactly word for word as if brother has been going there. He has been going there quite often soon after the 67 war He was there within six months after the 73 war, he was there. Pictures are given. He is ministering to wounded Israeli soldiers. Beautiful, beautiful. He is ministering to wounded Israeli soldiers. In more than 30 pictures in the liberated Palestinian, there is not a single Palestinian refugee in the book. No picture. But Israeli soldiers, average of two pilgrimages, He's leading people from America on a pilgrimage to Palestine two a year, average of two every year. What does it? This is belief. Once you believe that this is the destiny of your people to become slaves, to become cannon fodder and foreskin fodder for the Jews, I said, now, is this the book of God? People with reason, tell them to the Palestinians. I would like to see a Palestinian go and tell the people in the Gaza, go and tell them. That look, from the Nile to the Euphrates, it should be given to the Jews. Southern Lebanon should be given to the Jews. What does it? This is the book has done the job, beautiful job, of enslaving the minds of people. Now the Quran gives us a test. How are we to know whether a book is from God or not? It gives us a test. In Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 82, it says, Afalaya the Dabarun al Quran, do they not consider the Quran with care? Don't you see? Walau kana min indi hayrillah, had it been from anyone other than Allah, lawajadu fi hiltilaf al kasira. You would have found in it many discrepancies, contradiction. This is a test which we have to apply to any book claiming to be God. See whether it is consistent with itself or there are full of contradictions. I will only give you one. And I'm reading from the New Testament. John chapter 18, verse 9. John 18, 9. I'm quoting. That the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke. That the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke of those in inverted commas of those whom you gave me i have lost none close of inverted commas of those whom you gave me i have lost none none means not one not a single one who says that jesus how do you know it's in inverted commas ask any christian preacher and he'll tell you these are the words of jesus and in the Bible that's given to me, Brother Shurosh, thank you very much. This is called a red letter Bible. Red letter meaning every word that Jesus spoke is in red. So very easy, very easy to find out whether Jesus spoke these words or not. You open John chapter 18 verse 9 and it says it is in red. Which means these are the words of Jesus. In the Bible, the fifth major revision. Words of Jesus. It means he lost none, not one. 
Out of the 12 that God gave him, he didn't lose a single one. But in John 17, just one chapter before, verse 12, saying Jesus, he says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, he's talking to God, you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost. None of them is lost except the son of perdition, except one. Except one, Judas Iscariot. In chapter 18, he says he lost none. 17, he says he lost one. What did he say? Did he say one or did he say none? Stupendous difference. Contradiction. One or none. They don't mean the same thing, do they? One and none. You just add an N, it becomes none, but it's a world of difference between the two. So the learned men of Christendom, very ingenious, very ingenious. In this book, the words that are in red, I have another Bible, another King James Version, the sixth major revision, Another one here, also red letter, printed by the same Nelson Press, same printers, red letter Bible, you open it, chapter 18, verse 9, it is in black, it's in black, what happened? Look, they changed it, red to black, yeah. Because they saw, they saw that this is a contradiction. So to rectify, said no, but they're still in inverted commas. Who spoke the words? So he says, no, you see the difference is only one. I said, you know, in a court of law, if you testify like that, you say on one occasion one, another occasion you say none, you can be charged for perjury, bearing false witness, you know that? So now Jesus is in, is in the box. Either Jesus, you put him in the box, ask him, did you say one or none? Oh, it was not Jesus. Jesus said, look, I knew nothing about that. Then you put John in the box. Hey, you wrote in chapter 17, 1, and in chapter 18, you said none. How did you get that? But G he, John is supposed to be inside by the Holy Ghost. Who is the Holy Ghost? The Holy Spirit. Who is God? So, now God is in the box. We put him in the box. Excuse me, sir, did you say in chapter 17, 1, and in chapter 18, you said none? Did you? You know the difference in the meaning between one and none? Ask God. Look, we say this is not the word of God. Can't you see? This is not the word of God. We are telling you. But he says only difference is one. You see, time is running out pretty fast. The Quran gives us a quality control. It says the Quran is here to confirm what is right, what is true in the previous revelation, and wa muhayminan alayhi, and it is a guarding in safety, a protection of the previous revelation. Now let's see what it does. You see, in the book of God, the Bible, in the book of Exodus, we are told, we are told that Moses wants to see God and God tells him, no man can see me and live. But he's insistent. He said, look, oh Lord, I love you. I must see you. So right, I'll do a favor. I'll put you between two rocks. And he puts his hand in the opening, God's hand. He puts it in the opening. Then he turns his back and he takes away his hand. So Moses saw the back of God. He saw his back. He says, because my face can't be seen. You mustn't see my face. But the same book tells us that Jacob saw the face of God. Genesis chapter 32 verse 30, it says, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. Then, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 11, the same book where God says, no man can see me and live. Now he says, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face 
as a man speaks to his friend, not showing his back. Now we want to know which is the word of God. Did Moses see him or he only saw his backside? What is it? Why wouldn't God show his face? The face, the human face, you know this. Forget for a moment, forget it now, whether this is the book of God or not, forget it. Just on the human level, same sober level. God says in the Holy Quran, in the Bible, we are told that God created the heavens and the earth in six days. And on the seventh day, He rested and was refreshed. And was refreshed. Meaning after a tired, hard six days work, He needed rest and He had to be refreshed. The Quran says, وَلَكَتْ خَلَقْنَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا فِي سِتَّةِ أَيَّامٍ We have created the heavens and the earth and everything in between in six days. وَمَا مَسَّنَا مِنْ and we found no weariness, no tiredness, no fatigue in our creation. Now, take your choice. <laughs> I've got the God of the Bible who needs rest after six days and has to be refreshed, or the one who says he feels no fatigue in carrying and creating his creation. Then, the doctor had made very much in the last debate about God eating. He says, you know, we are denying him the right, the pleasure of eating. You know, those three angels that came to Abraham, and Abraham prepared the table, affected calf and cakes, barley cakes, and he set them before them, and they act, says the Bible. They act. God Almighty, he act. Fatted calf, and the angels, they act. Read it in the Quran, similar story about the angels visiting Abraham, and they say, the angels of the Lord, they don't eat. This food, you broil fish and honeycomb, is not the food of God, nor of the angels. Take your choice, the Quran or the Bible. God not omnipotent, this is the last one. But looking at them, Jesus said, Mark chapter 10 verse 27, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. We accept. With God all things are possible. But in the book of Judges, chapter 1, verse 19, I end with this. It says, So the Lord was with Judah, God, God Almighty was with Judah. And they drove out the inhabitants of the mountains. Judah and God, they, together they drove out the inhabitants of the mountains. But they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland. Because they had chariots of iron, they had tanks, armored cars, those of the day. So God Almighty, He couldn't prevail. The Quran says, Fa'alul lima yurid. He is the doer of all He intends. Take your choice, the Quran or the Bible. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed Didat. Ladies and gentlemen, the conduct of this meeting must not only be fair, but also seem to be fair. It is therefore necessary to address you on the following. An objection was raised by Dr. Anis Sharosh. You might not have heard it. He objected to a certain part of Mr. Didat's discussion on the basis that it was not relevant to the topic and of a political nature. This objection was overruled for the reason that although it was peripheral to the topic, it was employed as an example to substitute a point of direct relevance.
Ladies and gentlemen, another very, very important point of interest, and I appeal, uh, appeal to you respectfully not to in interject from the floor. This is extremely disruptive and counterproductive. Dr. Basil Jackson to introduce Dr. Anis Sharosh. Ladies and gentlemen, Salamu Alaikum. What an honor it is for me today to participate in this meeting and to be called upon to introduce my friend, Dr. Anis Sharosh. But before I speak specifically of him, I would like to thank in a special way the Islamic Propagation Center for all that they have done to make this meeting possible and in particular to Mr. Shamshad Khan for all that he has done and the effort and the energy that he personally has expended to bring this meeting to pass. Now let me emphasize that I make no claim to be a specialist in Islamic studies or to be an Islamic scholar. I would like also to emphasize my feeling of good fortune today. I have visited the Republic of South Africa on many occasions. And each time that I visit there, I stay with a Muslim friend and his family in Johannesburg. And two years ago, he introduced me to the works and to the studies of Mr. Didat. And therefore, it is a special honor for me today, sir, to occupy the same platform as you, a scholar and a gentleman. And now to the task at hand. Dr. Anis Shorosh is an Arab whose roots go back to Nazareth, the hometown of Jesus Christ. His tribal origins are the Rihanis of Saudi Arabia. Dr. Shorosh earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from Mississippi College a Master of Divinity degree from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, a Doctor of Ministry from Luther Rice Seminary in Florida, and three weeks ago, he was awarded a Doctor of Philosophy degree from Oxford Graduate School, where I first met him and where I had the honor to be one of his professors. He served as a pastor in Jerusalem until 1966, then felt God's call to international evangelism and subsequently moved to the United States. Seven books, five film documentaries have been produced by Mr. Shorosh thus far. 25,000 copies of his book Islam Revealed, his eighth book, will be released within a few weeks by Thomas Nelson Publishers. Please let us now welcome to the second largest city in the United Kingdom and to this historic occasion, the dynamic servant of Christ, my personal friend, and one of our guest speakers today, Mr. Dr. Anish Sharosh Rihani. Chairman, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, in a new Hayyikum, the Ismi Asu al Masih, Ibn Beladi, Wa Muhalisi, Wa Rabbi, I greet you in the name of Jesus, the Christ, 
the man from my hometown, my Lord and Savior. The Quran or the Bible, which is God's word? Now, to our topic, the Quran or the Bible, which is God's word, both of us, Christians and Muslims, face a rising tide of atheism, humanism, secularism, and materialism throughout the global village of over 5 billion people. There is a staggering amount of confusion concerning the doctrine of God, which is sweeping our planet. We must, we should, we need to bolster the faith of those who believe and put the trust in the revealed word of God. At this crucial period in history, large Christian and Muslim communities in some areas in the world, such as Russia and China, are placed under severe pressure to surrender their faith. Together, as Christians and Muslims, we must stand and insist upon the absolute validity of the Ten Commandments and the high moral standards revealed in our scripture in contradistinction to what the above-mentioned philosophies seek to enforce upon us. While in mainland China a few years ago, with my associate Mr. Sparks, who is with us this evening, I was urged by our two leader, who had been born in China from missionary parents, if the Chinese ask you, don't tell them that the West is more advanced than they are. Amazed and amused, I inquired, would that not be considered dishonesty? The reply was, no. Why not? I persisted. Because we do not want them to get upset and feel badly since they are convinced they are the most advanced society in the whole world. May I ask you, what is your reaction to such a situation? How long can you keep the bright sunshine from the eyes of the beholder? He that must blindfold himself forever or go into a cave and live there denying there is anything but darkness in this world. No, no, no. The time has come to lift the blindfolds of millions of eyes. God commanded on the first day of creation, let there be light, and there was light. Therefore, to answer the very serious question, the Quran or the Bible, which is God's word, I will reply emphatically with a yes and a no. Yes, the Quran is, and no, the Quran is not God's word. Bear in mind, please, I am an honest seeker, seeking fact, not fiction, researching for truth, not lies, attempting to find the right path, not the wrong one. My dissertation for the Doctor of Philosophy degree, earned earn only three weeks ago, is entitled Understanding Islam. I want to understand and know more about the Quran, the Prophet of Arabia and Islam, the religion of most of my Arab people. I say most because as of last year, Swimmer Institute give me statistics indicating there are 174 million Arabs, 14 million of them claim the Christian faith. I have tried to be objective in my research, careful, earnest, and many times spending time in fasting and prayer, believe me. Now I present you with my findings. It is my hope you have come with open, not closed minds, with genuine desire to seek truth, not surface interest. Some of my findings will not be very pleasing to you. They were not to me either. It is very possible that your traditional faith will be shaken in few minutes and your intellect challenged. What I'm about to present to you, I present as truth in love, not hate. The material is offered to instruct you, not to insult you. We want to analyze, probe, examine, and investigate our topic thoroughly. Yet, if you fear becoming irrational, as some of you have been jumping up and down, rather than stay rational. My advice to you, please, stand up and leave us now. However, before you make such a decision, let me remind you that you will have one solid hour of participation 
during the question and answer period, take notes, write your questions, and we'll try to answer them. We are holding neither a boxing match here nor a circus. You can go to the cinema or theater if you want to be entertained rather than disrupt the scholarly and historic discussion. Mr. Didat and I invite you, please vacate the premises and leave us alone in peace. The Sunday Express has a motto which I saw from the room of my hotel on the billboard. It says, when everything fails, men use their brains. Yours truly is a peaceful man. Even the name of my first son is called Salam, which makes me Abu Salam in Arabic. Back to our Chinese story. Since 1976, China has opened its doors to the outside world and the Chinese are convinced now that there are other nations who are socially, scientifically, and technologically more advanced than they. To use their own popular saying, China has finally stood up. In other words, China is seeking to catch up with the rest of the advanced world. Even the Soviet Union are now excited about glasnost, openness, and perestroika restructuring after decades of suppression, thanks to Mr. Gorbachev. Stalin is now recognized for what he was, a murderer of 20 million of his own people. Now, the Muslim world has been convinced for centuries that their religion is the best and the Quran is the last testament. If this is true, not fiction, authentic documents, not borrowed truths mixed with tales. Why then are Muslim governments so terrified of the freedom of religion? This freedom is available to citizens of every industrialized and Christianized country, but denied in theirs. Why did the United Arab Emirates last week in Sharjah denied me interest to preach in a church there for the past week? Mr. Iraq, to my knowledge, has never been denied entry to any Christianized or industrialized country in the world. Why have they built a formidable wall around their borders, mightier than the wall of China and the Berlin Wall? Why is a human being denied citizenship in Saudi Arabia if he is not a Muslim? We know of the Iron Curtain, Bamboo Curtain, but few seem to recognize the Muslim Curtain. Why do women and children fare so poorly in most, thank God, not all Muslim countries. Discrimination and prejudice are constantly the targets of the preaching of Islamic sheikhs and mullahs, but not practice. If truth is superior to a falsehood, then the only fear one should experience is fear itself. If Muslims actually feel something about these matters, I would like to suggest they look into the truth that we are about to share with you. Anyway, I have a dream. I have a dream. A dream when the close nations of the world will open their doors to the fresh wind of freedom of religion. Yes, freedom as Christ Jesus proclaimed, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. John 8, 36. Yes. I have a dream, a dream when men and women, boys and girls of all tongues and tribes, races and places can make the choice accepting or rejecting the revelation of God in Christ Jesus and not be stuck from their birth to their death with Islam, Christianity or any other religion. I believe if they accept Christ, Please note, I did not say Christianity or the Christian religion. They can learn to love God above all else, and through His Holy Spirit, they can love and forgive one another and live in peace. Across the centuries of human history, we have had many revolutions, religious, political, military, industrial, technological, and now the best is yet to be. The best of them all, right now, the truth revolution. What a glorious day, the truth revolution. Let us now into go, go into deeper waters. Here are some of the results of my research, analytical findings, 
concerning the Quran and what I can emphatically declare first the Quran is not the Word of God later why I think it is the Word of God I will appreciate the kindness of you those of you who are Muslims in our audience in allowing me to call your prophet either by the title of the prophet of Arabia or his personal name after all Muslims do not call Jesus our Lord Jesus Christ when we mention his name and you refer to him thank you now Mr. Dilak, would you care to tell us what does the word by itself Bible mean what is the origin of that word in what language when was it used beside the name of the town where it came from I also like to say that it will help to ask Mr. Dila to see if he can explain to you where did you come up with the word Isa in the Quran when his name is Yasua in Arabic I'd like to know about that I should also like to ask Mr. Dila a question to tell this great audience about his incredible book Al-Quran the ultimate miracle precious friends this gentleman has misled multitudes by his video books and cassettes and speeches on this 19 so-called theory which is now his hoax I wonder I wonder what else will come up from that direction what scholarship what brilliance what fabulous research by computers hmm. Muslims assert that Allah has revealed himself most clearly in a book not in the person of Muhammad in contradistinction Christians believe that in the beginning was the word and the word became a human being Jesus the word of God any reader of the Quran who is slightly familiar with the Old Testament discovers that the names and events of Old Testament books and prophets are very definitely copied in the Quran however often the stories in the Quran are garbled and confused Muhammad must have heard these stories from his Jewish friends in Medina where he lived during the time he said he received most of the revelations which became the Quran his seventh wife Raihana and ninth Safiya were Jewish his first wife Khadijah had a Christian background and also an uncle the eighth wife Maryam was part of a Christian sect from Egypt they undoubtedly shared with him much of the Old and New Testament literature drama stories of prophets and people the Quran singles out the following Old Testament names from among the 28 authentic prophets according to the Quran Adam no Abraham Moses Isaac Jacob Ishmael I like to know what did Jacob write and what did Ishmael write sir David Solomon Elijah Elisha Surah Al-Ma'idah 30 to 31 echoes of all things a fairy tale I read to you just verse 30 and 31 but he states here the mind imposed on both the killing of his brother on him the killing of his brother he's talking about Abel and Cain incidentally the Quran doesn't know their names they're never mentioned then it states that Allah sent a raven scratching the ground and by observing the story the scene now this brother buried his brother whom he had killed do you know that per Karabai Eliezer a story was written 200 years after the birth of Jesus tells us Adam and Eve sitting by the corpse of Abel wept not knowing what to do for they had as yet to know any knowledge of burial a raven coming up took the dead body of its fellow mate and having scratched up the earth buried it thus before their eyes that's the very exact words with the difference it's Adam and Eve instead of Cain and his brother if Islam could trace its origin and prophecy to Abraham then we would expect to find the Old Testament referring to Allah Muhammad 
Mecca, the black stone of the Kaaba, and the many ceremonies and practices of Islam. But the Bible is devoid of references to Muhammad, and there are no biblical references whatsoever to anything Islamic. It is much more reasonable to conclude that Islam grew from the polytheistic and animistic culture of Muhammad's tribe. In fact, the people of Mecca worshipped 360 idols, one of whom was named Al-Ilah, Muhammad's father. What was his name? If he brought new revelation, how come his father's name was, as most of you know, Abdullah, the servant of Allah, God. From the second Targum, dating back to the second century AD, we find the source of Surat al naml And it is very fictitious. I'm not going to read you the Quran. I'm going to read you what this is. And you think it's the Quran. Solomon gave orders. I will send kings and armies against thee of jinni beasts of the land and birds of the air. Just then the red cock, a bird, enjoying itself, could not be found. King Solomon said that they should seize it and bring it to by force. And indeed he sought to kill it. But just then the cock appeared in the presence of the king and said, a bird is speaking. I had seen the whole world and know the city and kingdom of Sheba, which is not subject to thee, my lord king. They are ruled by women called the queen of Sheba. The end of the story is fascinating. As the bird goes and carries a letter and she comes back and when she arrives, she sees the palace and the floor is of glass. She thinks it's water. She tries to uncover her legs and the king screams. This is in the Quran. Cover your legs. This is not water. This is not the sea. This is glass. What an exciting story to be written in the Quran. The New Testament is borrowed so much of it that in reality, there are so many sections of it that 130 passages in the Quran refer to the Bible as law, Psalms and the Gospels. Also the apocryphal fables. Surat Ali Imran, the family of Imran, verse 35 to 37, closely follows a spurious gospel account to evangelism and it talks there about the famous story of Zechariah, his wife and the birth of their girl. Christian heresies. It is fascinating to discover that Muhammad did not believe in the Trinity, the divinity and the resurrection of Jesus. To understand why this was so, we must examine the deviant doctrines of Nestorians and the followers of this man. Sectarian Christians who migrated to Arabia 140 years before Muhammad's birth. Muhammad apparently drew these denials from the heresy. Nestorius was the patriarch of Constantinople in AD 428. He did not believe the same truth as the Bible teaches and therefore he was rejected. And what did he do? He and his followers fled to different places, among them Persia and Arabia, where they made their acquaintance with the family of the Prophet. Most Christian scholars believe and Muslim history attests that Muhammad came in contact with Nestorians during his travels to Damascus when he was 12 years of age and Buhaira saw in him the possibility of a prophet. 12 years later, he convinced him of that, traveled with him and taught him most of what he knew about what we call the biblical stories from the Christian viewpoint. Heathenism. The ancient Arabs reported, reportedly had seven celebrated temples dedicated to the seven planets. Among them was the temple of Sana'a, which was built in honor of Venus, and the one at Mecca, consecrated to Saturn. Stone worship prevailed at an early period among the Arabs, as among many other nations. Stones shaped like the famed Egyptian obelisks and ten feet high. You can go with me to South Jordan and see it in the city of Petra to this very day. The ancient Nabataean Arabs worship these stone carved pillars. I want to ask you if you've been to the Hajj, why do you kiss that stone in the Kaaba building? Supposedly, 1,000 angels <coughs> pardon me, have been appointed to guard the structure. Apparently, they were careless in their duties because Abraham and his son Ishmael are said to have rebuilt it the first time and others did the same later 
after another flood. Some idols of the ancient Arabs are mentioned by name in the Quran. Allah, the chief idol of Taif, is supposed to mean the goddess. al uzza probably symbolized the planet Venus, although it was worshipped as the form of a bamboo tree. Manat was a large sacrificial stone. Sua was a female deity. Yakus was in the form of a lion. Yaru in the shape of a horse. And Nasser had the shape of an eagle. In front of the Kaaba itself was the great image of Hubal, the garden deity of Mecca. The secrets of Enoch and the testament of Abraham. The subject at hand is the famous Maraj of Muhammad. It is recognized as the night in which he went to heaven by way of Jerusalem, riding an animal as long as I could see whose face was the face of a woman with cosmetics on it. Aisha, surprisingly enough, declared emphatically the body of the Prophet of Allah did not disappear, but Allah took away his spirit by night. Here is the passage in Surah Bani Israel, which also has another name. Al Isra. Here it is. Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi laylan min al masjid al haram ila al masjid al aqsa. Glorified be he who carried his servant by night from the inviolable place to worship to the far distant place of worship. The elaborate story of this vision is expounded in Mishkat al Masabih, page 518 to 520. Muhammad told how the angel Gabriel took him on the winged animal al Burak and showed him all the seven levels of heaven in one night. The next morning, Muhammad announced that he had seen Adam, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and others. His followers said, what a wonderful thing. But the fact is, it is not so wonderful when you know the truth. You see, the fact is, we have this story written for you in the records called the Testament of Enoch, chapter 1, verse 4 to 10, and chapter 2, verse 1. And here's the exact words. On the first day of the month, I was in my house and was resting on my couch and slept. And when I was asleep, great distress came upon into my heart. And there appeared two men. They were standing at my couch and called me by name. And I arose from my sleep. Have courage, Enoch. Do not fear, the eternal God sent us to thee. Thou shalt today ascend with us into heaven. The angels took him on their wings and bore him up to that first heaven. As to the description of what he saw in the various levels of heaven, one can find an earlier record of the very same things in the details of testament of Abraham. Although Muhammad claimed he went to Jerusalem and worshipped at the temple of his, or in his spirit, the temple, ladies and gentlemen, had been destroyed by Titus in AD 70. Do you realize that the far distant place of worship, referred to as Aqsa Mosque, was not built till the 12th century, ladies and gentlemen? And in fact, Salah Dean made it a mosque. It was built as a church in a form of a cross two centuries before that. In other words, no such place existed at the time of the so-called heavenly journey. Even the Dome of the Rock, so appreciated by Muslims and others, was not built till AD 691. Sabians, ancient historians like Abi Isa, the Moroccan, tell that Sabians were the first religious people in the world. Their language was Syriac. Listen to this. They even consider Adam to have been a Sabian. Seba was said to be the same Seba, son of Kosh, son of Ham, son of Noah, mentioned in Genesis 10, 6 and 7. Their worship, listen to this, was monotheistic. Islam borrowed that. They offered sacrifices and prayed seven times a day. Muslim made it into five. The Sabians fasted 30 days a year, and that's exactly what we do in Ramadan if we are Muslims, breaking the fast at sunset much like Muslims do today. Dr. Ahmed Shah, a friend of mine from Lucknow, India, wrote a book called Theology, Muslim and Christian. He tells us that some writers mistook them for followers of John the Baptist because they also, beside all of this, baptized new members into their group. He adds that along with God, 
they all should worship stars and a hierarchy of angels. Contradictions in Islam. First, contradiction of science. I read to you, it says in Arabic, Listen to this. Till when he, this talking about Alexander the Great, reached the setting of the sun, he found it, the sun, setting in a muddy spring. Only the superstitions in the age of Muhammad believed that the sun would ever set in a muddy spring. Another absolute mystery to me is the mentioning of this Alexander the Great, known in Arabic as Dhul Qarnayn, the one with the two horns, as a prophet in a book supposedly sent from God up in heaven. In Surah Al-Nahl, verse 15, we see, وَأَلْقَى فِي الْأَرْضِ رَوَاسِي I want you to understand, it says here, and he hath cast into the earth firm anchors, not hills, as your Quran translated into Arabic. Ask any Arab about that. Surah Al-Hijr, verse 74, states that the devils, the devils, mind you, were driven away by stones. Talks about that. To this day, one of the duties of a pilgrim, ask any hajj, is to throw seven stones at the devil in Mina. Tell me about that, friend. Contradiction of Muhammad's mission. The Quran was and is an Arabic book for the Arab peoples, not for the world. This is substantiated by the fact that for 1300 years, no one translated the Quran into another language. In contrast, the Bible for the world has been translated in over 1,800 languages. Surah Ibrahim, verse 4, states, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ What says, we and we have not sent any apostle except in the language of his people. Muhammad lived in a land where the days and nights are nearly equal all year long. During Ramadan, Muslims are to fast from when they can distinguish a white thread from a black one, till this can no longer be done in the evening. In lands to the far north, the sun does not set for many weeks, as I have seen it in Alaska during Ramadan, but seems only to make circles through the sky. Therefore, Ramadan cannot be observed there. If Muhammad had been truly a prophet of God, his knowledge of geography would have been perfect. Incidentally, Many Christians observe that Muslims spend more money on their food during Ramadan than any time of the year except weddings. It is not a fasting, but a feasting month. Besides, what benefit is it to God Almighty for you to fast all day long and feast all night long? Contradiction of man's freedom. Muslims believe that whatever has or shall come to pass in this world, whether it be good or bad, proceeds entirely from the divine will and has been irrevocably fixed and recorded on a Muslim's heart or forehead. It is true that some passages of the Quran seem to attribute freedom to man, while others teach a clear and distinct fatalism. The followers of Muhammad have no knowledge of God as a loving, caring, compassionate Heavenly Father who has made us free moral being. From Surah at tawbah we read, Say, naught befalleth us, save that which Allah hath decreed for us. Another verse from Arad 27. Say, lo, Allah sendeth whom he will astray and guideth unto himself all who turn unto him. Women's inferiority in Islam. Polygamy and unlimited divorce. We are told in Surah An Nisa, verse 3, when this is, I hope, will not be misunderstood, but this is a verse in which it says, and if you can be fair to marry, marry as many as four, but if you cannot, Mary, just one. One is bound to ask, if Muhammad brought a greater and more perfect revelation, then why does man seem to regress instead of progress with the moral standards of the Quran? Jesus Christ enunciated 
who made them at the beginning, made them male and female. If God wanted man to have four wives, he should have made more than one Eve. Certainly, a Muslim husband may cast his wife adrift without a Muslim husband may cast his wife adrift without giving a single reason or even a notice. The husband possesses absolute, immediate, and unquestioned power of divorce. He can simply announce to his wife, I divorced thee three times, and she's gone. No privilege of a corresponding nature is reserved for the wife. Be quiet, I ask you to be quiet. The Old Testament. Are you civilized or uncivilized? The Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the last book declares God despises divorce. In the New Testament, we are encouraged and warned a man should not divorce his wife. I'm not talking about what they're doing, I'm talking about the word says. You be quiet. Here are two more verses from Surah An Nisa 411, 176, which the inferiority of the Muslim women are placed there. Allah charges you, notice this, concerning the provision for your children to the male, the equivalent of the portion of two females. Ladies and gentlemen, here is an amazing admonition. I read to you from Surah An-Nisa, verse 34. Men are in charge of women because Allah hath made the one of them to excel the other. And because they spend of their property for the support of women. So good women are the obedient, guarding in secret that which Allah hath guarded. As for those from whom you fear rebellion, admonish them and banish them to beds apart and scourge them. In contrast, God instructs Christians, husband love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Dear friend, I'd like to remind you, it was really an interesting thing when Muhammad began. While at Mecca, Muhammad, realizing that he was surrounded by enemies, taught his followers toleration. He was simply a teacher commissioned to deliver a message, even for a time. At Medina, he was moderate. In Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 256, we are told there is no compulsion in religion. La ikraha It was very different after Muhammad's power was established. When the Muslim armies went forth to attack the surrounding tribes and nations, they offered them three options, Islam, tribute, or the sword. Incidentally, is this not a proof that the spread of Islam was not for a religious and divine call, but economic? Because of the tribute, you didn't have to be a Muslim. Put yourself in that position with these choices. What would you and your family choose? As a result, numerous Christians paid with their lives, yet the numbers of those who took the easy way out vastly outnumbered the martyrs. History informs us that the 12 months following Muhammad's death were spent in bitter battles led by Khalid ibn Walid to bring back the Arab tribes who became apostate. Over one million Armenian Christians were savagely slaughtered by the Turkish Muslims at the beginning of the 20th century. Since that time, an Armenian secret organization assassinates a top Turkish leader or diplomat in some country at the anniversary of the massacre in this world. This is their way of impressing on the minds of the world the horror of that atrocity and their insistence on revenge. Such was not the past. It is still going on in the present. Over one million people have been killed in the war between Iraq and Iran, which are two great Muslim countries. 
according to a 23-page report filled 20 March 1987 by Khartoum University, Professors Oshairi Mahmoud and Suleiman Ali Baldo. More than 1,000 Dinka citizens, including women and children, were massacred in the western Sudan town of Diyam in 1987. The Baptist Record newspaper story of November 5, 87 adds that dozens of pastors have been killed and many churches destroyed since Islamic law was imposed in 83, when Sudan was officially declared as an Islamic Republic. Another report appeared in the Baptist World Alliance newsletter of September 87, page 2, indicating that 130 church buildings and pastors' homes of all Christian denominations in Kaduna State in Nigeria were destroyed by Muslim rioters. Surat al tawbah gives the following instructions for dealing with Jews and Christians. Fight against such of those who have been given the scripture as believe not in Allah nor the last day. According to a tradition, Ibn Abbas and Aisha, the Prophet, is said to have permitted the blood to be shed even of him who abandons his religion and separates himself from the community. This practice continues in some Muslim countries. However, the backslider is to be given an opportunity to repent in the Western world rather than have his blood shed. Consult Surat Ali Imran 83 to verse 90. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask you, have you noticed that one of the great things our Arab people say is that the Prophet Muhammad was illiterate? That's why the Quran is so great. Many experts of the life of Muhammad believe he was. However, such a claim is not tenable or credible. The claim may be an attempt to magnify the work of Muhammad in producing the Quran, though he was an illiterate, thus substantiating the so-called miracle of the Quran. Here are my reasons for your listening pleasure. We are told that when the treaty with the Meccans was to be signed by Muhammad, they refused to acknowledge him as the apostle of Allah. Relenting to their demands, he struck out that title and wrote with his hand, instead of Muhammad, Rasulullah, Muhammad, son of Abdullah. A second incident supporting his literacy occurred on Muhammad's deathbed. Realizing that he was dying, he motioned to Aisha, his favorite wife, out of 15 of them, to bring him something upon which to write the name of his successor. But he was too weak to write. Third, he served for many years as a trading camel caravan merchant who would naturally know the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, traveling to Damascus a number of times. Fourth, while visiting the St. Catherine's Monastery at Mount Sinai in 1979, I was shown by the monks a personal letter said to be signed by Muhammad himself, guaranteeing the freedom of the monks and their monastery. If this, is, if this can be verified, it presents strong proof for Muhammad's literacy. Finally, I wish to seal the truth and provide you an unequivocal, solid, sound, and overwhelming proof that Muhammad was literate. Here it is, from the famous frequently memorized Surah Al-Alaq. Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq, iqra' wa rabbuka al-akram, alladhi allama bil-qalam, allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam. One notices that Allah told Muhammad to read, and Muhammad read. Theoretically speaking, if one can read, then can he not also write? Why would Muhammad's God also state, who taught by the pen, by the pen? Do you realize that in the manual of hadith, which Mr. Didat had in the seats at Royal Albert Hall, page 3 to 6, we are told, Aisha said that the angel Gabriel ordered Muhammad to read three consecutive times and he read. I cannot understand for the life of me why Muslims insist on calling the most famous Arab leader, fascinating, formidable leader of Arab world, our Arab world, an ignoramus, an illiterate. This is not proper and I don't believe that and nothing supports that. Now, I'd like to ask you something. No one 
who studies the Quran in any language will fail to notice that there are monumental problems in its contents. Arabic speaking Muslims have made actually the Arabic translation to be sounding like the only word of God. Friend, let me show you something. Do you realize this is the type of Arabic the Quran was written in? I challenge you, not one percent of you can read it. The top and the bottom in the same mushaf. You see, Arabic did not have vowels. You could not tell whether it is daraba, duriba, or darab. Beside that, it is claimed by Arab scholars that the literary style of the Quran is superior to all other books in the Arabic language. Although this is not totally true, this claim no more proves the inspiration of the Quran than a man's strength demonstrates his wisdom or a woman's beauty her virtue. Only by its teachings, principles, and conceptual content can a book be judged rightly, not by its eloquence, elegance, poetic strength, or attractive cover. By reading the life of Muhammad and the history of the Quran, it is easy to conclude that the Quran reflects the life and character of Muhammad and the seventh century culture of Arabia. The Quran is not a unique literary masterpiece. There are numerous examples of other beautifully crafted poems, epics, and scripture from the classical period, many much older than the Quran. The Rig Veda of the Aryans of India was composed in Sanskrit between 1000 to 1500 years BC. It is larger than the Quran, similar in nature, and was written by several men. A blind poet by the name of Homer is responsible for the two most eloquent poet, poems in the Greek language, the Odyssey and Iliad. What should we say of the Gilgamesh epic, the Code of Hammurabi, the Book of the Dead of the ancient Egyptians, the tablets of Ibla, and other archaeological finds of ancient cultures? Just because these materials are unique or eloquent does not necessarily give them the status of divine inspiration. What about the fascinating writings of the prophets of Israel, which are poetic also and prose as well of the highest order? Remember El Qais, some of whose poems were among the famed Mu'allaqat, suspended poems at Kaaba, was one of the most eloquent of the ancient Arab poets before Muhammad. In one of these poems, which was not part of the Mu'allaqat, four verses appear which were borrowed and inserted by Muhammad into the Quran. They appear in Surah Al-Qamar, verse 1, 29, 31, and 46. I don't need to read them in English, I just read them in Arabic, and you can hear it. That's the Quran, Umr al-Qais. Then at al Verse 29. إِنَّا أَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ صَيْحَةً وَاحِدَةً فَكَانُوا كَهَشِيمِ الْمُحْتَضَرِ Verse 46. وَإِذَا مَا غَابَ عَنِّي سَاعَةً كَانَتِ السَّاعَةُ أَدْهَى وَأَمَرْ And then, بَلِ السَّاعَةُ مَوْعِدْ وَهُمُ السَّاعَةُ أَدْهَى وَأَمَرْ These verses, you can look at them if you get the book and find out the truth of that. The very same thing. أمر القيس دوت Umra al-Qais had a daughter who once she heard the surah recited aloud, she immediately recognized her father's poem and demanded to know how her father's verses, who had been dead for about 50 years, appeared all of a sudden, beginning the surah, اِقْتَرَبَتِ السَّاعَةُ وَنْشَقَّ الْقَمَرِ And here it is, دَنَتِ السَّاعَةُ وَنْشَقَّ الْقَمَرِ And Umra al-Qais was before Muhammad came. And now, to meet the challenge of the Quran in Surah 1790 and 1039, as Mr. Didat said. I'd like to remind you that poets before Muhammad and after him did just that. Furthermore, a small group of scholars in Jerusalem labored to achieve the fulfillment of a 16-year-old project. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kul ya ayyuha alladheena amanu. إن كنتم تؤمنون بالله حقا فآمنوا بي ولا تخافوا إن لكم عند الله جنات نزلا 
فلأسبقنكم إلى الله لأعدها لكم ثم لآتينكم نزلة أخرى وإنكم لتعرفون السبيل إلى قبلة العليا فقال له توم الحوري مولانا إنا لنملك من ذلك علما فقال له عيسى أنا هو الصراط إلى الله حقا ومن دوني لا تستطيعون إليه سبيلا ومن عرفني فكأنما عرف الله وهئنكم منذ الآن تعرفونه وتبصيرنه يقينا فقال له في ليب الحواري مولانا أرنا الله جهرة تكفينا فقال عيسى أو لم تؤمنوا بعد وقد أقمت معكم دهرا فمن رآني فكما فكأنما رأى الله جهرا For you who do not know Arabic this is precisely taken from chapter 14 verse 1 through 6 of the Gospel of John. Moreover, eloquent poets expressed in beautiful Arabic various religious longings and other themes. Man arafa nafsahu arafa rabbahu Whoso knoweth himself knoweth his Lord. Another example of Ali ibn Abi Talib. إنما دنيا فناء ليس للدنيا ثبوت وإنما الدنيا كبيت نسجته العنكبوت. Verily, this world is transitional. In the world there is no permanence. And verily, this world is as a house with a spider has spun. كيفية المرء ليس المرء يدركها فكيف كيفية الجبار في القدم هو الذي أنشأ الأشياء مبتدعا فكيف يدركه مستحدث النسم Man's man comprehendeth not the character of man How much then does the character of the omnipotent take the preeminence He it is who produced all things as an inventor How then doth one who renew his breath comprehend him there is no denying that the complexity of the Quranic scripture and Arabic must be explained by an expert of the Arabic language and culture before one can understand the contents. However, the same is true with Arabic poetry. While in secondary school in Nazareth, I studied and memorized some of the Mu'allaka poems. To my utter astonishment, some time ago I found in my library, while preparing for this debate, my own handwritten notebook with poems and their comments. Imagine looking at a booklet you wrote in class 40 years ago. Now we come to the exaggerations in the Quran, which are very obvious to anyone who studies it. Solomon's story, distorted and exaggerated. The Bible says that Solomon employed the people of Tyre who were skilled workmen to assist him in building the temple. The Quran says in Surah Al-Anbiya, 81 to 82, that the devils and the jinns actually did that for him. In Surah Al-Baqarah, the Quran says, Uzair and his donkey died for a hundred years and were then raised to life. We may accept the raising of a man, but when, what possible use is there to raise up a donkey after he's been dead a hundred years? The Bible says, that God gave the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. It never was a covering over the children of Israel, as the Quran states in Surah Al-A'raf 171. God turned humans into monkeys. So does the Quran say in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 60. Don't you know that? Let me read it to you. Are you ready? All right. Shall I tell thee of a worse case? than things for retribution with Allah. Worse is the case of him whom Allah hath cursed, him on whom his wrath hath fallen. Worse is he of whose sort Allah hath turned some to apes and swine. It sounds like Muhammad may have believed in reincarnation. Did the Quran bring any new revelation? Revelation is the process by which God imparts to man truths which cannot be known naturally. For example, since man was not created until the sixth day, God had to reveal to Moses details reflected in Genesis 1 through 5. The uniqueness of the Quran is also claimed due to the information it presents regarding the past and the future. However, these claims cannot be substantiated. The teaching of the Quran concerning God 
creation, prophets, and what have you, were proclaimed long time before Muhammad came. Muhammad brought nothing new. Perhaps some of this was new to his hearers who were ignorant. 99% of them could not read or write. Muhammad's revelation were in no way superior to the revelations given by earlier prophets, and neither did they unquestionably provide evidence of a fresh divine revelation. Theologically, authorities demand that six conditions be fulfilled before accepting any supposed revelation can be accepted as true revelation. First, it must satisfy the yearning of the human spirit to obtain eternal happiness. Second, it must coincide with the conscience, which is the moral law written in man's mind. Third, it must reveal God's true attributes. Fourth, it must confirm man's reasoning that God is one. Five, it must make very plain the way of salvation. Six, it must reveal God himself in books, through prophets and in person. Neither Muhammad nor the Quran fulfill all of these six requirements the Quran may fulfill the fourth partially and perhaps the sixth. That's about, oh, really? Now, Muslims believe that certain passages of the Quran are mansukh or annulled by verses revealed later chronologically than themselves which are called nasib. Ladies and gentlemen, I appeal to your intelligence, please. This is taught by Muhammad in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 106. مَا نَنْسَكْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نَفْسِهَا أَوْ نُنْسِهَا That's right. مَا نَنْسَكْ مَا نَنْسَكْ Is that what it says? Such of our revelation as we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring in place one better of the light thereof. Knowest thou not that Allah is able to do all things? What is called the sword verse in Surah at tawbah annuls 120 verses which originally encouraged tolerance. One tradition has it that Aisha declared emphatically that the Surat as saf the ranks, 61, had 200 verses during Muhammad's lifetime when Muhammad actually died and Uthman standardized the Quran. The Surah had only 72 verses. Incidentally, most any Quran you have has different verse numbers. The number of the annulled verses are so numerous because there are 40 surahs which are plagued with this major problem of a so-called inspiration. This concept is certainly very unacceptable and foreign to an all-wise God. Compare such belief of Muslim theology with what Christ Jesus announced according to Matthew 5, 17 and 19. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The problem with the Qibla, another proof of this strange belief is recognized in that Muhammad communicated to his early followers in Mecca that the Qibla, the physical direction of their prayers, was the word Kaaba. Then he abrogated that once he migrated to Medina so as to please the predominant Jewish population. Now he emphasized to his followers they must turn toward Jerusalem. Surprisingly enough, 17 months later, 17 months later, Allah changed his mind for the second time by commanding Muhammad 
to look towards Mecca again and no longer Jerusalem when Muslims pray. A man makes mistakes, ladies and gentlemen, and needs to correct them, but such is not the case with God. God has infinite wisdom and cannot contradict himself. We must ask, does God have two Qur'ans if the system of abrogation is valid? We ask again, what does one do with this emphatic declaration in Surah Al-An'am 34? And there is no changing or altering to the declaration or decisions of Allah. Muslims claim that the Quran was originally written on tablets preserved in heaven. This concept, however, is clearly borrowed from the Bible because Exodus 32, 16 tells us, now the tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Muhammad professed to have a revelation through Gabriel when it suited his purpose. Many students believe, students of the life of Muhammad, messages came from heaven, were given to justify his political and moral conduct, as well as much of his religious precepts. Battles were fought, wholesale executions inflicted, wives added, and territories annexed under the pretext of the Almighty's command. Now, I want to challenge you. Mistakes in the Arabic of the Quran. You say you speak Arabic. Let's find out. Muslims believe that the Arabic Quran is the perfect, exact representation of Allah's word. That is why only the Arabic Quran is considered authoritative and why so many Muslims who know no Arabic still feel a compulsion to memorize portions of the Quran in Arabic, although they cannot speak it and communicate with you. However, Muhammad used a number of foreign words or phrases in the Quran, leaving questioners wondering if God's language is deficient enough to need help from other languages. An orator demonstrates his speaking abilities by not borrowing expressions from other languages. How then do we have the opposite in a book which God himself is supposed to have inspired in Arabic? Foreign words. Pharaoh comes from the Egyptian language. Adam from the Akkadian language. Basharan should have been the word or insan, which are the Arabic words. Ibrahim comes from the Assyrian. A more accurate word will be Abu Rahim. From Persian, we have Harut, Marut, Sirat, Hur, Jen, Ferdos. From Syria, Tabut, Taghut, Malakut, Zakat. From Hebrew, Habir, Sakina, Jahannam, Ma'un. From Greek, Injil, which means Bishara, good news. That is not all. Here is the Arabic Quran with words from Egyptian, Akkadian, Assyrian, Persian, Syriac, Hebrew, Greek, seven languages. An Arabic reader is astounded also at the obvious mistakes in the following surahs. First, Surah Al-Baqarah 177. The word Sabirin should have been Sabirun, if you know Arabic. Then again, Surah Al-A'raf 160. وَقَطَعْنَاهُمْ إِثْنَتَيْ عَشَرَةَ أَسْبَاطًا Should have been إِثْنَتَيْ عَشَرَ سِبْطًا Surah Al-Nisa 162 وَالْمُقِيمِنَ الصَّلَاةِ Should have been وَالْمُقِيمُنَ الصَّلَاةِ Then Surah Al-Ma'idah verse 69 As-Sabi'een is the more correct Arabic than As-Sabi'oon Then At-Tawbah فَإِذَا سَلَقَ الْأَشْهُرُ الْحَرَامِ Should have been فَإِذَا سَلَقَ Plural the words kun fayakun are a gross error in Arabic. The grammatical structure demands kun fakan. Let there be and there was, not there shall be as in the Quran. Yes, sir. Going forward, Abraham's father is wrongly called Azar in the Quran. At Surah Al An'am, verse 74. The Bible, however, which is much earlier than the Quran, names him correctly, Tarah. Abraham, summary of the Quranic errors concerning Abraham. Abraham didn't have two sons, he had eight. Genesis 25, not two wives, but three. He did not raise his descendants in the valley of Mecca, but in Hebron, which is called by his name in Arabic to this day, Al-Khalid, the friend of God, according to Isaiah 41.8 and Genesis. 
Genesis 11 discloses that his home to town was Ur in Chaldea, not Mecca. He wandered through Haran, as Genesis 11 recounts, not Arabia. He went to Canaan, as God instructed him in Genesis, not to Mecca's valley. There is no record that Abraham and Ishmael went to Arabia and built the Kaaba in Mecca, although he did spend several years in Egypt. In Surat al Safat, those who set the ranks, verse 100 to 112, we read of Abraham's sacrifice of his son, but which son? The Bible states it was Isaac. Genesis 22, yet the Quran intimates it was Ishmael. The Arabs have considered Abraham as their earliest father through Hagar, Abraham's second wife, and Ishmael, his firstborn son. As for Mr. Didat question, my roots go back to Joktan Kahtan, who is the father of most of the people of Saudi Arabia. However, historically, the first father of the Arabs is this one, mentioned in Genesis 10, 25, his name Kahtan in Arabic, Joktan in English. The names of some of his sons are reflected in geographical locations in Arabia, such as Sheba, Hazarmut, Ophir, Havila, until this very day. A third strain came from Abraham's nephew Lot, whose two daughters gave birth to the Nabataeans, to the Moabites, and the Ammonites. A fourth strain came from Jacob's twin brother, Esau, according to Genesis 36. Finally, and most people forget this strain, Katura, whom Abraham married after Sarah's death, gave birth to six more sons, who also became forefathers of more Arab tribes. Therefore, Abraham was only one out of five of the forefathers of our people. The savage struggle that's going on between the children of Ishmael and the descendants of Isaac has caused many to wonder. Instead of the blessing of Abraham, it seems to be bloodshed. We read in Galatians 3.16 that it is neither Isaac nor Ishmael who are to bless the world, but Messiah Jesus as Galatians 3.16 affirms, now to Abraham and his seed, where the promise is made, he does not say, and to the seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. Ishmael too, we see promises made to him, listen to this fantastic truth. And Abraham said to God, Genesis 17.18, oh that Ishmael might live before you, then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. God's promises to Ishmael, one is mystified at the precise fulfillment of the four promises made to the Arabs by God through Ishmael, even in our very day. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, will make him fruitful, will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget to a princess, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac. First, with three-fourths of the free world's oil reserves, the Arabs believe they are definitely blessed. Second, there are 174 million Arabs as of 1987. As I said earlier, 14 million of them claim Christianity, according to Zwemer Institute. Third, he shall beget twelve princes. We have practiced it wise that many Arab nations today. Fourth, I will make him a great nation was fulfilled when the Muslim empire became a reality from the 7th to the 12th century. Moses, listen to this. The Quran says, baby Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's wife. The Holy Bible says, Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. The Quran calls Haman a friend of Pharaoh. The Bible places Haman 1,000 years later in the book of Esther. Third, the Quran says God appeared to Moses in the fire in the valley of Tua. The Bible says it was on Mount Horeb, Exodus 3.1. Fourth, the Quran says the golden calf worshipped by the Israelites in the wilderness was molded by a Samaritan. The Bible says Aaron made the golden calf, Exodus 32, 2 through 4. In fact, the term Samaritan was not used until 722 BC. 5. The Quran says the cow sacrificed by Moses was yellow. The Bible says it was red in Numbers 19, 1 through 2. These are just a few of the contradictions between the Quran and 
the Old Testament. Now, Mary, the mother of Jesus, one of the most erroneous errors in the Quran is the reference to Mary, the mother of Jesus, as the sister of Aaron. Her identity seems to be irrevocably confused. The investigation taken up in Surah Maryam 1928 says, Ya Mary, The Mary of the Quran, the Mary of the Quran depicted as the mother of Jesus is 1,000 570 years removed from the genuine Mary, as indicated from Numbers 2659. The name of Amram, Amram's wife was Jochebe, the daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt, and to Amram, she bore Aaron and Moses and their sister Miriam. The valiant effort of Muslim theologians to explain that the Quran is simply stating her lineage from the priestly family of Aaron and Imran is totally unsatisfactory and not substantive. This mistaken Quranic identity is obvious historically. If you read Luke chapter 1, you'll find who she was. Now, the birth of Jesus. The Quranic account in Surah Maryam 21 to 23 tells us that miraculous birth of Jesus took place under a palm tree. When you read the Gospel of Luke, Jesus was born in a stable. Where do you find the story of the birth under a palm tree? Here it is, and I have the book. This book has it for you. And here are the words, page 38, from a third, from a second century AD apocryphal fable. Now on the third day after she, Mary, was waited in the desert by the heat and asked Joseph to rest for a little while under the shade of a palm tree, then Mary looking up and seeing its branches laden with fruit, they said, I desire if it were possible to have some fruit, just then the child Jesus looked up from below with a cheerful smile and said to the palm tree, send down some fruit. Immediately the tree bent itself toward her and so they ate. This is from a fable. Now, fables about Jesus. Two of the most far-fetched, ladies and gentlemen, and fantasy-filled fables ever attributed to Jesus are recorded in the Quran. Surah Maryam says, verse 29 to 30, فَأَشَارَتْ إِلَيْهِ قَالُوا كَيْفَ نُكَلِّمُ مَنْ كَانَ فِي الْمَهْدِ صَبِيًّا قَالَ إِنِّي عَبْدُ اللَّهَ آتَانِي الْكِتَابِ وَجَعَلَنِي نَبِيًّا Then she pointed to him, they said, how can we talk to one, that is Jesus, who is in the cradle, a young boy. He spake, Though I am the slave of Allah, he hath given me the scripture and hath appointed me a prophet. The first gospel of the infancy of Jesus Christ, which is a second century Arabic apocryphal fable from Egypt, is the source for this Quranic fable. Chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. Jesus spake even when he was in the cradle and said to his mother, Mary, I am Jesus, the son of God. That word which thou didst bring forth according to the creation of the angel. Next, we look into the tale that Jesus breathed life. Jesus breathed life into the birds of clay, according to Surat Ali Imran. Jesus breathed life into the birds made of clay. Incidentally, if that is true, only God can create. So what Jesus, what was Jesus? The source for this Quranic fiction is found in the earlier Thomas's Gospel of the infancy of Jesus Christ, an apocryphal fable from the second century. Then he took from the bank of the stream some soft clay and formed out of eight twelve sparrows. Then Jesus, clapping together the palms of his hand, called the sparrows and said to them, Go, fly away. Neither of the above quotations are recognized by biblical scholars, historians, or theologians as authentic events in the life of Christ. Now, ladies and gentlemen, 
Listen, please. The Quran, the Quran, although anyone who reads the Quran finds instructions about God, morality, worship, duty, and the lives of some prophets, one thing emerges as a missing ingredient. This ingredient, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, fellow human beings, is how can a man please God? How can a man be justified or be right with God Almighty? The Quran encourages personal glory. God is presented as an intelligent giant with a will and a law to which man must obey without any example of divine love such as Calvary. God is like a general marching with a sword to subdue the world and force men to become his slaves rather than his sons. A Muslim is told to declare the kalima or a shahada, pray five times a day, fast one month a year, give alms, go to Mecca. These will open the gates of paradise for him. Better still, as one leader declared last year, kill and be killed for Allah is a declaration for he states that is the highest honor for a Muslim. I question the credibility of such a statement. Sooner or later, one will get tired of such a life or get too old for it. Even if we agree that keeping the five pillars of Islam is good and honorable, tell me how or who is going to pay for your sins? For example, here is a man who owes you 100,000 British pounds. He struggles to pay you back. But all he can pay is 10,000. Then who is going to pay the rest? Again, a lady breaks the speed limit. The policeman stops her. She sobbingly tells him, I'm sorry, I didn't know the speed limit, and on and on. He will certainly sympathize with her, but she broke the law. Again, this man robbed, raped, then murdered your daughter. He is captured, imprisoned, brought to trial. He weeps and pleads, I made a mistake. I've done wrong. Forgive me. I repent. Will you let him go free? God's holy Bible states, the soul who sins, it shall die. Ezekiel 18.4. Therefore we ask, who will pay for our sins? You say, why our sins? Because God tells us, all have sinned. How? By being born from Adam and Eve, the first sinners, by choice, by inclination, by thought, by sight, by deed. Have you ever told a lie? Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever told a lie? If you have, raise your hand, please. If you don't, if you don't tell a lie, you ought to be in heaven. That's the only perfect people in the world. Now, in short, the debt, the debt, the debt has to be covered. The breaker of the law has to be penalized. The criminal has to be condemned to death. Judges and magistrates see to that. Conversely, the justice and holiness of God demands payment for our sins. Our good works are like filthy rags in the sight of God Almighty. The sin problem must be resolved, my friend. If not, then mankind, according to Islam, is accepting the seeking of man's glory through good works rather than obeying the will of God Almighty by accepting his atonement, a free gift of salvation. How do you deal with the radical evil of the heart? Where can you find justification, holiness, salvation, assurance of eternal life? Man's need is not to know what is right and wrong. All of you know that. It is for the power of the Holy Spirit that can make that a reality. Please remember, Justification is not found in religion, is not found in Mecca, is not found in Varanasi, is not found in Rome. It is found only in Christ Jesus. It is found in a person whose name is Jesus the Christ. He loves you and he gave his life to set you free. I conclude, I conclude, yes, yes. The Quran is the word of God. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, 
One more minute, and I'm through. One more minute, and I'm through. Jesus said, Jesus said, don't throw your pearls before pigs. And if you understand what that means, I want you to understand, yes, the Quran is the word of God. Only. I am glad you are happy. The Quran is the word of God. I repeat. Dr. Only when it precisely, when it precisely, completely, absolutely agrees with the word of God, the Holy Bible, theologically, doctrinally, and linguistically only. attention. Ladies and gentlemen, may I please have your attention. Now there appears to have been some confusion amongst some of you with regard to time, as demonstrated by your gesticulating to your watchers, Dr. Anis Sharosh actually presented his rebuttal for 15 minutes and thereafter his address for 75 minutes. Mr. Ahmad Didar will in due course present his rebuttal for 15 minutes. He had 75 minutes. He didn't show one example. One example. 75% of this book is copied in that. And he could not show as one example. You see, you, you know what is to copy, what is to crib, what is to plagiarize stealing somebody else's literature. Look, the Christians and the Jews have been at it. I do not think it deserves clapping because none of you is so intelligent to know all the answers. Because you would be God. Dr. Shoro said, Muhammad was not an ummi. He was a literate man. And he lied again about the history of Islam that at Hudaybiyah, Muhammad changed the words to Muhammad ibn Abdullah instead of Muhammad Rasulullah. What the Holy Prophet Muhammad did was, he is instructing the scribes when the Quraysh, the pagans, the mushriks, when they objected to Muhammad Rasulullah, Muhammad sallallahu he told the scribe, cut off Muhammad Rasulullah. So the disciple in love and feeling, they said, no, we can't cut it off with our own hands. We can't cut it off. We can't say that Muhammad is not Rasulullah. So now what to do? The treaty was being jeopardized. So the Holy Prophet is asking, where are these words, Muhammadur Rasulullah? So he saw the word Rasulullah and he took the pen and he marked it off. That is what he did. He didn't put Muhammad ibn Abdullah. You see, what we need for things like this, discussions like this, we need more time. We need point by point discussion. In 75 minutes, you throw 150 red herrings and say, come on, catch, 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 catch. It is not done. <laughs>